what we have now, our next presenter is Dr. Kutic, who all of you know already, I'm sure. Uh, in fact, when I spoke about the symposium in Washington, you were the first one to run up and say, I'm coming to, to King of Greece. <laughs> Unfortunately, guess what happened along the way? This pandemic set things back, but nevertheless. Uh, recently retired professor of the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Medicine and Public Health. He has served as the medical director of the Wisconsin State Laboratory Hygiene, the state's public health laboratory. He received his medical degree from the University of Michigan in 1976, has served his pathology residency at the University of Wisconsin in 1985 and assumed the directorship of the UW-Madison Cytology Lab and School of Cytotechnology from Dr. Stanley Inhorn. 1987, he established the University of Wisconsin FNA service, the UW Cytopathology Fellowship. He also directed the general pathology course for the University of Wisconsin uh, of Medicine. National service, uh, my goodness, the list is long. A secretary treasurer of the American Society of Cytopathology, past president of the ASC in 2020. He has served seven years as a member of Cytopathology Test Development Committee in the American Board of Pathology, has served nine years on the American Society of Clinical Pathology Board, Registry for Cytology, seven years on the CAP Cytopathology Committee, and is the current president of this very same society that's putting on this event. Uh, co-author of um, numerous uh, publications, associate editor of the Milan System, associate editor of the International System for Reporting Serious Fluid Cytopathology, 25 years National Ski Patrol, and something I did not know, a second Dan World Taekwondo. Don't mess with this man. Dr. Daniel. Thank you for the It's my privilege to talk today about Hashme Moriyama, who worked with Dr. Papa Nicolau for many, many years. Hashme Moriyama was uh, his artist, born in 1879, and lived, as you've heard, till 1954. His life was molded by a series of uh, uh, national and international events. There was a series of devastating events going on in China that affected the whole Eastern Hemisphere. It was the end of the Tokugawa Shogunate and the Meiji Restoration that I'll talk a little bit more about. And then there was World War II and the Executive Order 9066 that sent uh, many Japanese immigrants to internment camps. There's no financial conflict of interest. All the images are used are public domain or um, usable by educators, especially those from National Geographic. So the 1860s, were not only a time of armed conflict for the United States on our civil war, but another civil war with revolutionary societal change raged in Japan. Um, the conglomeration of events to the Meiji Restoration was a response to contact with the West and what was going on in China. In China, there had been two opium wars where the uh, Qing Dynasty and the uh, um, European powers, France and England, uh, had fought to force the uh, use of opium. And then in 1850, there was the Taiping Revolution um, where 20 million Chinese died and another 30 million were uh, displaced. And it was a, a series of events as horrendous as World War I, but we had not heard as much about it, at least in the West. The Meiji Restoration saw the end of 260 years of the feudal Tokugawa shogunate and saw the emperor restored to power, um, essentially, or at least a central government with the emperor at its head. The last battle of the restoration was in 1877, termed the Satsuma Rebellion, and that was two years before Murayama's birth. During the restoration, the capital of Japan moved from Kyoto to Edo, and centers of learning and industrialization were created in Tokyo. Japan had to modernize. They had to move fast, quick, before they were subject to the same sort of forces that they saw uh, and feared in China. In Kyoto, um, half the population left, and they went elsewhere. And uh, there was great worry in that city about the loss of 
traditional culture. So just as an orientation, Kyoto is here, and Tokyo, you can see, is uh, far to the east. One of the things uh, in response that the city fathers of Kyoto did was petition the imperial government for a way to preserve the traditional arts of painting and ceramics and weaving, and uh, the emperor allowed the generation of a Kyoto City University of the Arts, then called the Imperial College of the Arts, on the grounds of the palace in Kyoto. The emperor has a palace both in Kyoto and in Tokyo. Uh, this was uh, Moriyama's alma mater. Not only did it generate uh, people uh, who knew traditional arts, but also in their desire to modernize and uh, learn about the West, the uh, impressionistic, the realistic, the uh, romantic arts from the West were incorporated in the education. Around that time, around the 1900s, I should say, a surge of emigration occurred. The Japanese government wanted people to go abroad such that they'd bring back techniques um, to Japan, 400,000 left, and over 200,000 to the United States. This uh, document is an imperial Japanese passport. This comes from my wife's family. Uh, Fukukoba came across with two babes in arms, uh, two children to San Francisco in 1905. Um, and of course, uh, uh, or excuse me, in 1906, Moriyama came in 1905. 1906, she got there just after the San Francisco earthquake. There's family history of uh, it being very difficult to find housing. Moriyama came over the West Coast, but then he got a position at Cornell and uh, he prepared teaching materials, publication materials, generated microscope drawings, and made models for their educational purposes. Mariama also got involved in the local arts scene in New York, and he uh, had exhibits at the Met. Uh, he did one that's notable in this historical record of, about Japanese art. In 1910, Nao Makino, his uh, senseis or his teachers, daughter joined him in New York where they were married and this was followed by the birth of two sons of uh, Ken in 1911 and Tsutimi or Sammy in 1919. Because of the extent legal system Hashime could not become a citizen in the U.S. but was still eligible for the draft and this is his draft card. Um, his two sons though born in the U.S. were citizens. So this is a picture of the Murayama family with the elder Murayama being on the left, and Tsutimi or Sammy next, and now, and then Ken. First and foremost, Hashime considered himself an artist, and in the 1920 sentence, uh, uh, census, he filled in artist in the uh, profession uh, section. And then in 21, he was hired by National Geographic as its first uh, staff illustrator and resident artist, and over the next two decades, he produced numerous works which were featured in National Geographic and other scientific publications. He did color images of birds, insects, aquatic animals, frequent highlights of the journals, and uh, um, presented a number of exhibitions of natural history art. That you can still get some of the copies of this, uh, these publications through eBay and Etsy. Um, and you can see here he got uh, top billing and his byline is also over here. Color images were hard to come by, right? Um, here's uh, Hashime Murayama at work. I'll show you a couple images first. So this is uh, one of his goldfish pictures, and it's a style called romantic because um, it was highly detailed, but it clearly is not a photograph. It's not realistic, but it certainly brings the detail and the essential features of his subject. He was known to be Japanese stereotyped and be very exacting in what he did. He would count the scales on these things and then measure them and proportionally reduce them to put in the paintings. And so um, and his art is amazing. Color printing was a problem in those days, right? Um, it was not easy. It was very expensive to generate color prints in anything. And so uh, artists had not only to know about the drawing or a painting, but had to understand paper, had to understand the printing process. And it was essentially lithography, at least since the late 1800s, 
you'd have to take an image, you'd photograph it, then you'd have to use filters to separate that image into um, its uh, cyan, magenta, uh, yellow, and, and uh, black uh, images, and then you would impress those images, etch those images, and first limestone and then zinc plates, and then you'd uh, use ink to absorb on those etchings and then put them on paper, highly registered form. And so it was expensive. It was a real job. And that's why there were a lot of printers. That's why um, we didn't get black and white images off the, uh, out of our journals uh, until uh, relatively late because uh, the printing process was still expensive. Nowadays, of course, it's all gone digital and uh, it's much cheaper to produce uh, images. And also we get 5 million now catalogs in our mailboxes full of bright, wonderful colors and it's very cheap for them to do it. Although I put those mostly in circular piles. So the art didn't all go one way, that it wasn't only the Japanese that were trying to learn Western art. The uh, painting, especially the uh, woodblock type ukulele A, uh, things that came from uh, Hosegai and other people from uh, Japan were widely appreciated by Western artists, especially uh, the Impressionists. So people like Monet and Manet, Degas, Van Gogh, they bought these things up and they uh, impressed uh, um, them to the degree that uh, they used them in the art. The first one here is La Japonaise, which is, uh, uh, I'm mispronouncing it, but um, this is uh, Camille, Monet's first wife. And then there are just a series of studies of uh, the water lily garden that Monet created in Giverny, and it's a wonderful place to go. I'd never been impressed with how beautiful um, a layout of flowers could be. And here's my wife, Tina, on Monet's bridge, and uh, um, uh, it's stunning, it's emotional. Here are some more detail. These are three squirrel fish. And this one impressed me because I used to do a lot of diving in the Caribbean. And so, uh, you know, very exacting. Sergeant Majors, his famous uh, angelfish of various forms, a couple more. This one, uh, for collectors of Muriyama's work, uh, the Portuguese men of war is well known and then the six seahorses. He also did whatever National Geographic needed, and so there were other um, types of drawings. His first love always seemed to be the, the aquatic forms. Most of the writing relative to Hashimi Moriyama relate to his experience during World War II and what happened to Japanese immigrants. Um, in 1921, he was either, excuse me, just after Pearl Harbor in 41, he was either fired from or left National Geographic under unclear circumstances um, with the rising tide of resentment against uh, and fear relative to those of Japanese ancestry. There is a predisposition, a predisposition to interpret historical events through a modern lens and not through the context of the time. But I'd like you to remember that, you know, there were parochial narratives all over the world. Um, there was ethnic isolation all over the world. Communication was much more primitive. The best thing was AM radio. There was panic over events going on, what was going on in the Western Pacific, in the Philippines, in China, in Southeast Asia. Phenomenal of deaths were being recorded daily. And there was great fear that imperial forces would show up on the West Coast. There was one incident called the Nihau incident, uh, which added to that. Now, certainly there was an abrogation of the rights of citizens born in the United States. And, and the immigrants weren't treated well. Um, the treatment of Japanese was stimulated by that paranoia. And this incident, where after the second wave of aerial attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, one Japanese aircraft crashed on Nihau Island, which is a small island in the Hawaiian chain. The pilot was captured, survived. Um, he convinced a Japanese immigrant and his wife to help him escape. The pilot was subsequently killed and, and the helper committed suicide. And the U, uh, event, the single event, was used as partial justification for internment 
and Executive Order 9066. This is Topaz Camp in Delta, Utah, uh, pictures sometime 43, 44, and typical of the internment camps that were used for those of Japanese nationality during World War II. As it says, 122,000 men, women, and children were forcibly moved to San Assembly Centers, and 70% of those were citizens. In Delta, Utah, the museum that they have is the, one of its major features, and it's called the War Relocation Center Museum. My wife's family met at Topaz, or my wife's mother and father. And so without Topaz, there would be no Tina, but nonetheless, um, it, it traumatized uh, the mother and uh, a lot of things related to those uh, three years that she was in camp. In the uh, museum, they have a number of exhibits. Surprisingly, for such a small town, it's excellently done. Um, there are a lot of artifacts of what they created. They redid their whole society inside that camp. There was music, there was art, there was education, um, a lot of crafts and things like seashells to make these bouquets. They used to take wire from screens, coat it with tissue paper, stain it, and do weaving, uh, whatever they could get their hands on. Um, the museum has all those artifacts, and we've gone there once, but it's a little trip from Salt Lake. So the elder Murayama was interned in 42 and 43 with his family on suspicion of espionage and once was detained uh, for five months on Ellis Island. Uh, it's unclear if his activities of his son Ken had anything to do with these. Son Ken had gone back to Japan and was a journalist and worked for Dome, which was the Japanese uh, national uh, press. And it may have put the family under increased suspicion, don't know. But Moriyama was saved for longer internment by Dr. Papanikolaou and the faculty of Cornell, uh, who first, after he left National Geographic, they offered him a position to illustrate cancer cells. And um, Papa Nicolau appeared, appealed to the Federal Alien Enemy Hearing Board on the basis that Moriyama's work was of national importance. There was no one else who could do what he could do. And he alone had the skill set to perform the work. Uh, Papa Nicolau managed to gain the support of the U.S. Attorney General, Francis Lippitt, who secured Moriyama's freedom. And the three works of note, 1943, uh, diagnosis of uterine cancer, the hard to come by, 1948, epithelia of women's reproductive organs, and the major work that occurred in every uh, laboratory uh, was the Atlas of Exfoliative Cytology. There was recognition, of course, as Dr. Uh, Chancy Antonio has gone over, that prior to the cytologic method, cervical cancer diagnosis was by biopsy, which is an operative procedure. And of course, they had to use a speculum to open the vaginal vault, use tenaculum, those clamps with points to pull down the cervix to look at it and then biopsy it. Um, such a bi uh, procedure is not suitable for mass screening. And so it came to be that the aim of the cytologic method was to use a simple, inexpensive technique with wide sampling to detect both early and advanced lesions. Colposcopy, which many have touted, didn't really arrive in uh, the U.S. until the 1960s. And it had a, a somewhat dark history because although developed by Hensman in 25, it was done in Germany, and it had been used in concentration camps on uh, people who uh, were unwilling. So Moriyama, when he was given the task of looking at Papa Nicolau's slides, paid attention to the objectives of the PAP method. There's, there are crisp nuclear profiles, profiles. There's chromatin detail. There's cytoplasmic transparency and functional differentiation of the cytoplasm. The color is being imparted by metabolic activity or uh, 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 pH. And, um, and also you were already shown this. This is an example, these plates are examples of uh, what was in the book. And this is how he described them that they uh, gave you a line, they gave you the figure numbers, and you went over and you looked at the cells. And the detail is remarkable. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get to work on a number of books lately with other people's images, photographic images, and do some color balancing, and so became interested 
and Murayama, and uh, again, uh, I'm astonished. So, in the era before generally available color photography, Murayama's images were used for training and for reference. They were universally present in these laboratories. This is uh, the State Laboratory of Aichi in 1952. And I want to point out this lady, Norma Arvold, who was a med tech. Norma um, went to see Dr. Papanikolaou in 47 at Cornell, got trained, brought the technique back to Wisconsin, and then 10 years later set up an early school of cytotechnology. Uh, this is Norma in the foreground. And Norma is especially important to me because Norma, being the quintessential person with the pencil in the ear and the ruler in her hand, taught me and any other, many other residents a love of cytopathology. Um, so, you know, getting our fingers wrapped and doing the right thing was Norma's job, and I've always appreciated her. Mariama not only did cytologic images, but in the epithelia book, there's plenty of histology. There's a drawing on the left. And on the right, he did take photog uh, photographs, black and whites, and then colorized them, and then they were put into the book. And there are four images of uterine prolapse where you can see the characterization. And then on the bottom left, there's a, bottom right, excuse me, there's a carcinoma in situ. The result, as you all know, is that there was a remarkable decrease in deaths from uterine cancer. Here from uh, 2007, American Cancer Society showed an 82% uh, decrease in the death rate from cervical, or excuse me, from uterine cancer. They did not separate cervical from uh, endometrial at the time, but this is uh, an important graph. So, Murayama in the 1954 uh, atlas was responsible for many or most of the images and this most famous text, and this incorporated not only cervical cytology, but they were starting to explore other sites, and so this is breast, both benign and malignant breast cells. This was published in the year of his death, and as was mentioned, he never got to see it. He never also got to go back to his first art, um, the naturalistic art, and which I believe was a disappointment to him. But he was in the midst of a crusade. Ashmi Murayama lived through turbulent times and through technical skill and passion for his work rose above those times. He should be remembered for his art and his accomplishments, not only for you know, uh, what he um, suffered as, a, as an immigrant here. He is directly responsible for producing graphic materials that resulted in saving thousands of lives and contributing to the advancement of anatomical pathology. So, Thank you very much for your attention.